All right, so welcome back again. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about software vulnerabilities. So last week we were talking about malware, which is essentially where a program has been intentionally programmed or created in order to do something bad or something that, the, that you're not expecting it to. So the person who wrote the software is malicious. Uh, software vul vulnerability is actually a, a similar problem, uh, but it's caused by an innocent mistake. So the person who is actually creating the software actually has the best of uh, intentions. They are trying to create a piece of software that you use um, to browse the web or you know whatever software you're using. Um, but they've made a mistake that causes um, serious security consequences. So even when an author um, or some software is trying to do the right thing, it's really easy for to make a mistake that can result in attacker uh, and an attacker taking control of that software or making it do something that the author didn't intend it to do. Um, so, for example, a buffer overflow vulnerability is usually it's a one-line mistake in a, for example, a C or a C++ program. Uh, the, the, the programmer makes one mistake, they forget to check the bounds on, on something. So it's a one-line program mistake. The consequence of that one-line mistake is that an attacker on the internet can like connect to that machine, send something that that um, piece of software isn't expecting, and actually subvert the behavior of that program and take full control of that software, essentially. Uh, and then start controlling what that program's doing on that computer. And it takes, basically it assumes the identity of whatever user was running that software. So as we discussed in um, the first week, I talked about how um, Linux and Unix security is based on this idea that each program running actually runs with the authority of the user that started it. Now, if um, the user starts a program, say for example, you start up Firefox and you trust it, you trust that Mozilla were, tr were doing the right thing, you trust them to put have software running on your computer, but say a programmer that works for Mozilla made a programming mistake, that might actually result in an attacker being able to take control of Firefox on your computer and therefore basically do anything you can do on that computer. So it's unfortunately it's really easy to make these kind of programming mistakes. Uh, so I guess the question for you guys is what are some software vulnerabilities that have been in the news recently that you might have heard about? Shell shock. Shell shock. So yeah and Heartbleed are probably the two biggest um, news items in terms of software vulnerabilities recently. Um, and they're both Unix-based software vulnerabilities. Um, <coughs> let's not forget that Microsoft Windows um, has security patches almost every single month. There are critical vulnerabilities discovered, so it's nothing new. It's just new because um, they have catchy names and they are actually they're, they're very high impact vulnerabilities. So Shellshock is, was a bash vulnerability, so that's the um, command line interpreter on a Unix system. Uh, you could basically make it run commands that um, just by setting an environment variable, which is obviously bad. Um, and Heartbleed was another vulnerability uh, in OpenSSL, um, which was an information leak vulnerability. So anyone could connect to a web server that was running OpenSSL, which is the majority of websites that used um, secure connections. You could connect to it, send a specially crafted message, and in response, you got a random piece of memory from that um, computer, which is quite a serious security problem because anything can be sitting in memory, including security sensitive things. Um, so those, those are two very recent software vulnerabilities, but essentially they're discovered basically on a weekly basis. You can sign up to um, alerts so you can see um, you know, the security advisory says they're sent out and it's just, it's an endless stream of programming mistakes being discovered. And, um, you know, it is, it's a serious problem. So a vulnerability is a weakness in the security of a program. Often it's due to a design decision or an implementation mistake. 
So, for example, if you decided to design a system where you uh, accepted a password from a user, uh, and then you, when you receive a command, you, you run that uh, command from a user. If you allowed the command to come before the authentication, that would be a design mistake. So you would be a, a mistake in the design of the solution of your program. An implementation mistake is like when you're programming and you've actually got a really good idea in your head, but you just make a mistake in your actual code. Um, so you forget to check some kind of some length of something that you're reading from a user, or you forget to check that what the user's entering is actually what you're expecting. Um, and that is the biggest cause of um, software vulnerabilities is people just don't validate and sanitize the data that comes from a user. So for example, you're creating a website. Basically, anytime you accept any information from someone using your website, you need to check before you start using that information, is it what you expected them to enter? Or have the, are they trying to do something tricky? So um, an exploit is the piece of software that um, basically attacks that program mistake. Um, so it's the act of breaking a vulnerability. So if I know that there's, um, say for example, either of those examples, Heartbleed or Shellshock, there's a server that has this vulnerability sitting on it. Um, if I run an exploit, so a piece of software that, that actually um, is designed to <coughs> take advantage of that program mistake to do something that the author did, doesn't want me to be able to do. So for example, it might cause a buffer overflow or command injection and these are things that you'll, um, you'll understand um, fairly soon. Um, and as a result, it does stuff. So for example, we might end up in, with arbitrary code execution. So that's when I'm able to make that computer do anything essentially. If I, can, if I have arbitrary code execution, it means that I can run any code I like as a result. That's like the worst case scenario, basically. Um, but there are other kinds of um, vulnerabilities. So maybe I just have the ability to write into a database. Or maybe um, I have the ability to, deny, for, to do a denial of service attack. So basically, if, it, if the mistake just makes the machine crash, <laughs> then maybe I just have to send something to that computer, and that machine <laughs> goes offline. So that can still be serious. So um, you know, if you're Amazon and your servers go offline, you're losing a lot of money. Um, but the ability to run arbitrary code on that machine is, is a lot worse because then I could do all sorts of things to that computer. So actually exploitation is when I run that exploit against the server and I do something on their system. And a payload is what happens as a result. So I cause um, the, I exploit the system the vulnerability, and I send along a payload, which is the code that happens as a consequence of successfully um, exploiting the system. So some examples of types of payloads might be an information leak, like Heartbleed, where it comes back um, with some information to me. I might have a denial of service payload. Um, so even if I have arbitrary code execution, I could do a denial of service and basically just say run the shutdown command, for example, and that machine turns off. So denial of service is where I basically stop people from being able to access the resources that, are, that the systems are providing. And arbitrary code execution um, basically just means I can just run whatever I like. So I could run database commands, I could run shell commands, so just this programs. Um, instructions for that machine to carry out. Um, or I might end up with execution of machine code. So if, for example, I managed to um, inject code into like a C program or a C++ program, um, basically I can take some machine code, which are the basically the assembly instructions uh, that the CPU interprets. If I can basically inject that into an existing program, that program will happily carry on and um, start running the commands that I've basically just injected into that program. <coughs> um, and as a result of 
being able to run some code, there's all sorts of things that I could do with that. Essentially, I could do basically anything. Uh, but the sorts of things that you start off doing is uh, shell code. So shell code is basically some way of providing the attacker with the ability to run commands as they like uh, on that system, as opposed to just injecting a specific command. If we end up with a shell, then we have the ability to basically just interact with that computer as though we're sitting on a, at, a, at a terminal. And we can start running uh, commands on that system. <laughs> Uh, often in real time, so we like, we might actually just have like a, a a Windows command prompt on the attacker's machine, and they can start running <laughs> commands, uh, or you know a bash prompt on a for a um, Linux or a Unix system. Uh, but you know we might send specific code to add a user to a system, or maybe spawn a, a VNC server so that we get graphical interaction. Not usually what you want, but you know maybe maybe you want to be able to look around the desktop for some reason. Um, so how does it work? So the simplest way would be for our payload to basically spawn a bind shell. So a bind shell is just where the, um, the, the bind shell just listens to the internet traffic, opens a port. Uh, so it might listen on port, I don't know, 4444, for example. And then the attacker can just connect to that port using Telnet or whatever program they like. Um, and as a result, they get the command prompt and they can start running commands. Um, can anyone think of a reason that that might not work? The result of, you know, when if the result of our attack is that a port opens on that machine that we're attacking and then we can connect into it, why might not that work? Yeah, the user that you haven't privilege to isn't elevated users, so it's just a web server user that can't do anything. Yes, so that that's that's true. We might have limited access when we get to that machine. But what might stop this whole process from working? A firewall, yeah. So the the problem that and that solution worked fine um, back before firewalls were commonplace on um, PCs and servers and things. Nowadays a firewall is usually in place. And at a bare minimum, a firewall usually has a rule, not always, but typically the rule is we'll accept any connections that we establish outside, but we will contro tightly control the connections that we didn't ask for that comes into this computer. So, um, so that stops the attacker from, you know, if, they, if the attacker manages to spawn a bind shell and they try and connect in, they're just going to hit that firewall and they're not going to be able to actually connect to that computer. So the solution is actually to create a payload that's a reverse shell. So um, and in that scenario, the attacker starts by creating, um, opening a port on their own system and listening. And then the payload from that exploit actually creates an outgoing connection from the victim computer out to the attacker. Uh, and that just, that will um, basically subvert the firewall rules. Because most firewall rules are um, open enough to basically just allow anything outgoing. And it, and you could always, can, you know, if you're listening on port 80, there's hardly any firewalls going to stop someone connecting out on port 80, because how would you browse the web, for example? So, um, so that's how that works. So a reverse shell, the attacker listens for the connection, then triggers the um, reverse shell, which talks back to the attacker's machine and establish that connection. And then the attacker has that command prompt window where they can start sending commands to that machine because that connection is now established and communication can flow both ways. <coughs> so this comes back to what um, Chris said about the fact that you might end up with limited access on the machine depending on the, um, the permissions that the program is running at that you manage to take control of. Um, so one of the, um, a type of an, of an attack is a privilege escalation attack. So once you get some access, you might actually be able to get yourself some more access. So privilege escalation is where you get elevated access uh, beyond what you would normally have access to. Uh, and there's two kinds of privilege escalation. There's vertical um, privilege escalation, where you basically 
you end up with access to resources that are for higher privileged users or, or applications. Um, so for example, you might start off as a normal user, you do a privilege escalation attack, and you end up as an administrator on that system. Um, the other kind of attack is horizontal privilege escalation, where you might start as one user on the system, you do the attack, and you end up as another user on the system. So I, I managed to attack Chris's server that, and end up running as Chris on his computer. But there might be another user on that system that I'm interested in, and I might manage to get access to that user, and therefore access to a different set of stuff on that computer. Window of vulnerability uh, is, is a term that just means the time between when the vulnerability exists to when an end user's computer is protected. Uh, do any of you guys know what Patch Tuesday is? Yeah? It's a Microsoft Patch Day, isn't it? Yeah. So Microsoft's Patch Day, it's, it's, it's the second Tuesday in each month. Sometimes they also release patches on the fourth Tuesday, depending on how many security vulnerabilities have been discovered that month. Um, so basically what Microsoft do is they hold on most of the time, unless there's something really urgent, they fix the code, but then they won't actually release it out to users until a particular date. So they hold on to their patches, and then um, you know once a month there's a huge lot of patches that get sent out. And they do that mostly for practical reasons. So if you're a, sys a sysadmin, you're in charge of um, making sure that all your computers work after an upgrade. It makes your job easier if it's just like once a month because you can get your servers ready and you can test this, test it out before you roll it out to your organization. Um, but that does mean that the, the vulnerabilities out there, potentially for a while before it ends up, the fix is actually on an end user's computer. Um, so basically it works like this. So the person writing the software makes a mistake. As soon as they make that mistake and commit the code to the repository or however they're managing the software development process, um, there's a bug in that software. Uh, and you know they release the, some software to the users. Uh, so I think with Shellshock, the vulnerability was actually was like 20 years ago or something, 25 years. It was a long time ago that someone made this mistake, and no one no, no one publicly noticed it until just. Um, well, was it this month or last month? Um, so, so yeah, the, so the, the bug's there for quite potentially a long time. But eventually, an attacker will find the bug. The attacker may or may not tell everyone because they might be working for, um, you know, themselves or for an organization that do doesn't have your best interests um, in, um, in mind and that you can might imagine who I might be talking about. Um, so they decide to ho they might decide to hold on to that information, but eventually um, the vendor hopefully will find out about the problem. So it might be because the the attacker is is white hat, so he's a good guy, and he discovers the problem and des decides to inform the vendor there's a problem. Then the vendor takes a while to actually code up a solution to that problem. Uh, and then they release that publicly, um, and they, you know, nowadays hopefully there's like an automatic update system where your computer, your software will automatically update itself so that it fixes the problem. So uh, if you're talking about Windows, then um, you know once a month your computer is going to install a whole bunch of um, updates all at once, uh, which will hopefully fix the the majority of the problems that have been reported to Microsoft in that time frame. Um, so you can see there's a there's obviously there's quite a big gap in this timeline where you're vulnerable as an end user to an attacker who knows about the vulnerability. So the vulnerability might have been discovered a long time ago, and then maybe they've been using that bug potentially for years before actually someone finds out uh, about the problem. So an example I'm thinking of is actually just. Today, it was discovered um, a worm which has been called Sandworm um, because the code includes references to Frank Herbert's um, Dune, uh, which is a great book, by the way, a series of books. Um, 
that actually exploits a zero day in um, in Microsoft Windows uh, to get arbitrary code execution. And so that's out there. It's now been discovered because someone found that worm and analyzed what it was doing and figured out it's actually attacking a programming mistake in Windows. Um, and now the race is on for Microsoft to fix it before too many people start exploiting it. So today, at this very moment, there's a known zero-day exploit in Windows that you could go out and exploit to take control of a Windows server or system on a network. Um, and at some point in the future, Microsoft will roll out an update for that, um, probably on the next Patch Tuesday. Um, and then, you know, eventually people will be, you know, have a defense against it because they will have fixed, uh, updated their system. Obviously, if you don't apply updates, then you are leaving yourself vulnerable to all sorts of things. Um, I guess a question I don't, I think I may have asked this to you guys last year, so forgive me if I have. And if you still put your hand up after having been asked this again, then shame on you. Does anyone here use um, Adobe Reader and do you not apply the security updates that you get prompted for? Does anyone, I've just, please show, show me your hand if, if it's you. Is there anyone in this room? Uh, did I put you off admitting to it? I can find me sandbox at Adobe. Because we've got a sandbox. It won't there be. is a sandbox, but there have been multiple times where people have managed to break out of that sandbox. So. So I'm glad none of you put your hand up then. But last time I asked that, there was about three or four people with their hands up. Um, so in that in that example, um, there are older versions of Adobe um, Reader with software vulnerabilities where basically if you open a malicious PDF document, an attacker can take control of, um, of that software. And that's actually one of the lab tasks that you'll do um, in, over the next couple of weeks. It might even be this week. So, a zero-day vulnerability is a term that just means that it's a new problem that's been discovered. So, like the sandworm vulnerability, for example. Um, there's zero days in order to issue a fix because it's it's already known. That's what it means. It means it's a it's a new problem that doesn't have a fix yet. Is a zero day. <coughs> so, how do you go about? telling the world about a new vulnerability that you've discovered. So if, as a security researcher, you are testing a system and you come across a new vulnerability, some new thing that allows you to attack a system, what do you guys think would be the approach that you might take in order to um, you know what would you, what would be your next step? You've just discovered a new vulnerability. What are you going to do about it? Yeah. So you're saying actually deploy some kind of detection against it. But who? So the qu the question is, who are you going to tell? Tell the, people the software. Software. tell the vendor. So go to the software vendor, um, and then what? Are you? Do you want to set them a time limit? No, you, you say, well, I found an exploit. I can do this. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Give me money. I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> That's how it works, right? So, so you don't give them all the all of the information. That's you ask for money in exchange for the information. What if they don't give you money? Set a time on it and then release it. Okay. Um, so what? So that essentially that the this has been a heated debate within the security industry for a long time, and um, the question is whether or not you go public with information. And what we've basically found is that if you don't have the threat of going public. A lot of companies will just ignore the security advice that you give them. So if you contact a company and say, "Here's all the information I knew about a vulnerability I've discovered. Uh, take, you know, I'm not going to tell the world, but you should fix this." Actually, what happens is it might not get fixed. You know, they might actually just sit on that. They'll basically review it and go, "Oh yeah, that's real, but 
I don't think anyone knows about this. Um, we've got other things that are going to, it's going to make us money in the meantime. We'll roll out some new features instead of fixing the old ones. So the the response to that is actually full disclosure, where you actually go, well, I'm just going to tell the world straight away. And you just go on the internet and you give all the details about how to attack a system. And you just post them on the internet. And basically, companies do respond a lot faster in those instances. <laughs> and they tend to fix the problem. Um, but what that means is that you know we're creating that window of vulnerability where we're basically telling the world a way of it attacking a number of systems that are vulnerable. And essentially, you're facilitating um, systems being hacked, right? So if you're actually trying to do the right thing, that's probably not the first step you go for. So the middle ground, yeah? Are you just illegally allowed to do that? Can't they see you or anything? Just, just putting it out of there? Uh, they could probably try and see you, potentially. <laughs> Um, yeah, it depends what this. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a it's a grey area because well, not necessarily. It's not illegal to test software on your own computer generally. So you could find a vulnerability without breaking the law. You could tell the world probably you're not breaking the law. They, I mean, they can try and sue you. There have been people that are trying to give black hat talks. So that's a conference in Vegas and there's a few other places and um, there have been talks that have been legally uh, challenged and um, but generally the, gen generally the legality of it may or may not be breaking the law probably not but I'm not a lawyer so uh, full disclo disclaimer disclaimer don't, don't, um, don't come back to me if you do get in trouble. Uh, but so the, the middle ground there is responsible disclosure. So actually what you do is you tell the vendor, you give them some time, so you give them all the details, but you also give them a time limit. So you say, here's all the details, you've got 90 days to roll a patch out to your users, for example, 90 days. Um, and if at the end of that time you haven't gone public with a fix, I'm going public with the the details of the attack. That's actually considered to be an ethical approach because it gives the company time to fix it and an incentive to fix it sooner. So that's kind of the middle ground. Um, so, you know, some of you are thinking about money. Obviously, you could use um, you could use your knowledge to make money, right? You could start attacking systems and actually at attacking, you know using your knowledge for illegal criminal activities, right? Um, but you could work out the, the best interest of security in general and the world in general and do the right thing by telling the company and not asking for anything in return. A middle ground, again, we've kind of found this, like um, one of the solutions is to give some incentive for people to do the right thing. So a lot of companies have a vulnerability reward scheme. So, for example, Google have a re reward scheme. So if you tell them about a, a um, security vulnerability and you're right and they verify that you're right and you've given them a chance to fix it first, uh, then they'll generally give you money as a reward for having done that. So generally, it's a $500 to $3,133.70 and you may or may not get the in-joke there. Um, and um, if you and at some events they give out a lot more money, so I think it's pwn to own competition, which is run um, I think annually, where in those competitions they actually have quite big rewards to people that win those competitions. To you know, um, so there might be, for example, up to like sixty thousand dollars. If there have to be a pretty impressive bug for that to be the case. Um, so Mozilla have a bug bounty as well. So they'll pay from $500 up to $3,000. So these are US dollars. Facebook have a um, bug bounty, so they'll pay $500. And there's also um, lots of other companies have uh, bug bounty programs. And there's a uh, the internet bug bounty is a um, 
is a, a program where they basically uh, program with two M's and an E, uh, where they um, will reward you for discovering vulnerabilities in a whole bunch of different programs. So in order to actually claim the reward, you actually need, they require you to follow responsible disclosure. So you need to give them time to fix the problem before you go public with it. So from Facebook's um, disclosure policy, um, and this was, um, you know, may have changed since then, but it, it reads, if you give us a, res a reasonable time to respond to your report before making any information public and make a good faith effort to avoid privacy violations, destruction of data, and interruption or degradation of our service during your research, we will not bring any lawsuit against you or ask law enforcement to investigate you. Having said that, um, there, I think it was around 2012 where someone did hack into Facebook and they did turn around and try to, to sue him. Um, but the argument was that he didn't follow responsible disclosure correctly. Um, and that basically, I believe the, um, the, the way the hack worked was they hacked into a staff account. And as you can imagine, um, probably the average Facebook um, developer has access, I would hazard a guess that it would be to everything, probably. Um, you'd hope that's not true, but I would actually be surprised if it wasn't true. Um, so, yeah. Um, so they didn't count that as being like the correct way of going about it. So essentially, um, there's also there are other um, vulnerability reward schemes as well. So it, there are companies like Tipping Point, um, Secunia, <laughs> uh, iDefense, and they'll basically pay you to give them exploits that you don't release publicly. Uh, and some in some cases they will use it to protect their customers for a while before <laughs> releasing technical details. Some of them will sell those details onto government agents, agencies. So you can sell your exploit to a company that will then sell it on to the NSA and GCHQ, allegedly, potentially. And um, you know other people. Uh, there's Actually, there's a new one announced this year by Kevin Mitnick, who's uh, obviously a very famous um, hacker from the 90s who um, but he, so he's recently started a, a company, uh, a, a program where he sells on exploits to governments and things as well. So whether or not that's ethical, I guess, is an issue for another conversation, I guess. Um, whether, well, no, okay, I'll, I'll get on my soapbox. So if you, if you sell your vulnerab vulnerabilities to a government agency, they may or may not use it for the national best interest. But as a consequence, everyone is left with a vulnerable computer. So if, for example, Shellshock had been discovered years ago and that information was sold on to, for example, the NSA, then um, they could be using that to hack into a whole bunch of machines. But as a consequence, a whole bunch of machines are also vulnerable to attack by black hat hackers. So I would urge you that if you do go in the future and you are working in this area, which I'm sure some of you will go on to do, then um, I would urge you to use responsible disclosure. Project Zero is a, um, a, pro a project by Google that started this year. Um, and they actually employ security researchers to look for new vulnerabilities in popular software. So they've got a, a team of um, security experts, essentially. They do some amazing stuff. They've got a great blog as well, if you want to read some of the technical details of what they're doing. It's, it's quite impressive, some of the things that, that they've done. Uh, but they um, actually actively look for security vulnerabilities in order to fix them. So Google's interest is obviously to make the internet secure because they want everyone to be using <laughs> their services, I guess. Um, but to you know to be using the internet, so it's a it's a worthy pr um, goal and an important project. Um, so yeah, so they hire people to actually look for vulnerabilities. So just a bit about legality. Make sure you have permission before you start doing any security testing on a system. 
if you're doing ethical hacking, it basically means you've got legal permission to do a security audit. Um, if you um, don't have permission, it can be legally dangerous. You don't really want to end up in jail. Um, <coughs> you're more, more, more or less, it's fine if you're testing software that you've got running on your own computers, right? So you can try and um, attack your servers that you've set up to try and find vulnerabilities in software. So if you install Microsoft's products on your own server and you start attacking it, probably that's fine. I'm not a lawyer. Um, but if you start attacking someone else's servers, like Facebook's, for example, you're in a lot grayer of an area because you are automatically breaking various laws about unauthorized access and things. And they may tell you that they're not going to take you to court as long as you follow responsible disclosure. But that's not binding. The you know there are laws in place that are against it's against the law to be hacking into someone else's server. So you know just be careful. If you're if in doubt, seek some legal advice. I'm not a lawyer. Um, Traditional mitigation. Um, so usually the solution to these problems is to update the software. So you, the vendor fixes it and you keep your software up to date. Um, you know you can have patches, which is just applying a certain change to a software to fix a specific problem. And they may might be provided by the vendor or it could be a third party. Someone else might write a patch to fix a problem. Uh, and the fix might be applied either um, to the source code or to the binary code. Um, the other thing we can do is actually do vulnerability scanning. So we might actually scan our servers to see if we can find known vulnerabilities. Uh, so we actually use automated tools um, and you know we might actually run those against our own servers to look for problems that are known. Um, we might also use um, specific tools um, to actually protect against certain types of attacks and things like that. Uh, and we could do like penetration testing where we actually hire an ethical hacker or we may, might be that ethical hacker that tries to use all the same techniques and that other attacker, attackers use to actually um, <laughs> attack the system. So Metasploit is a very important piece of software that you can use um, to carry out attacks. It's an, it's an exploit framework. Um, so it's developed by HD Moore and it's free in um, open source software or the framework is and then there's other layers on top of that that's proprietary software so software that, you, that isn't open source. Um, so Rapid7 now owns Metasploit and they provide some interfaces to the underlying open source stuff that you can only get if you um, have a license with Rapid7. It's highly modular so it's, it's an incredibly powerful piece of software. You can combine different exploits and payloads together, um, which used to be very difficult because when it, you know, a decade ago when you're writing an exploit, you'd write it in C code and then you'd have this dense piece of code that would be the shell code and then you'd have this piece of code that's the payload. And now, but Metasploit can do all that for you automatically. So you can combine exploits and payloads together. And there's a whole bunch of modules you can use to do different kinds of attacks get different kinds of payloads, um, different ways of encoding information, and the stuff that you can do after that. So it contains over a thousand exploits, so there's a whole bunch of um, operating system flaws that it knows how to attack. So for example, it can attack a bunch of different um, versions of Windows and Linux and Mac. It can attack Apache, IIS, um, different applications that it can produce um, files that, that will um, basically attack those client-side applications like Adobe Reader, Internet Explorer, Firefox. And there's some support nowadays for web uh, web app attacks as well. So um, MSF payload, um, you can use that command there that you'll actually do in the lab uh, this week. And you can actually see a list of all the payloads that Metasploit has. And that includes giving you various types of shells, like bind shells and reverse shells that we discussed before. Um, and you know there are different uh, payloads for most types of most platforms. Um, there's different encoding methods. So you can actually encode your exploits and payloads so that it, it avoids detection. So you might have different ways that a company is detecting attacks on the network. So they might use an intrusion detection system or something like that. If you encode your payload 
you can actually avoid detection in a lot of cases. So you can change the encoding so that this, essentially the same information is being sent but in a different way. So that might be by um, basically having encrypted payloads or it might use different ways of different commands for um, do it having the same net effect. Um, and you can also bind and convert payloads to executables. Um, and there's lots of different encoding methods you can use. Um, so Metasploit Framework has a number of different interfaces. So the, the framework itself, you know, it's got, it's got a exploit modules and payloads and encoders and post-exploitation auxiliary and stuff. But on top of that, there's different ways you can access that. So you can use MSF CLI, which is the command line interface. You can use MSF console, which is one of the most powerful ways of using Metasploit, which you use quite a lot in this module. Uh, there's Metas Metasploit Community or Pro, which is essentially the, the web-based interface that Rapid7 have developed uh, that's a proprietary solution. And there's Armitage, which is developed by a third party, and that's a graphical interface uh, that you can use to, um, to use Metasploit. And that's, that's quite, quite a nice interface. So if you're actually using Metasploit, basically you start by specifying which exploit you're using, you set your options for the exploit, you choose a payload. Uh, so what we're actually going to do on the system, we choose encoding methods if we want to, and then we launch the exploit. And um, here's an example of a set of commands that you could run to do that. Uh, and then as a result, we get access to the machine. So why, why does the traditional defense, um, why does it fail to protect us against these attacks? The traditional approach of fixing, updating the software, why is it bound to fail? problems with the new code that released. Exactly. New stuff is discovered and then we just need to fix it again. So it's this never-ending kind of cycle of all playing catch-up to the attackers that find new ways of breaking a system. So in conclusion, um, you know, we've talked about malware last week, we've talked about software vulnerabilities now. Those are essentially the most common types of security threats that we face at the moment, practical, technical threats. And in both cases, the attacker uh, is able to run malicious code in the context of a process that's running on the um, system, um, which means that they can take control of that software and do stuff on that system that you know, the users and the people who own that computer don't want to happen. So it's kind of, it's essentially an identity problem. So, you know, the programs that we run on our computers are not necessarily acting in our best interests. And, you know, there's just so many ways of, of attacking a system. So I hope you guys um, found that interesting. And uh, the lab this week, you'll actually start using Metasploit to exploit existing software. And, um, yeah, so that's software vulnerabilities. Thank you.